Hello, Michael Irish Football Fan TV. I am delighted to be joined by Republic of Ireland Under-21 manager Jim Crawford. Jim, how are you? Pretty good. How are you, Paul? I'm good, good. Enjoying the warm weather at the moment, you know yourself. But uh, we've been, I suppose, well, I've been granted access to yourself for a one-on-one. -on -one, and I suppose what I wanted to kind of speak about firstly is just kind of a bit of a background profile on yourself because I feel like not enough people probably know a background about yourself and obviously in regards to your footballing career so do you want to take me right back to where it all began because i've had guests on the last number of uh number of months and stuff like that and they've been telling me all about from the early early days and what their first memory of football was and why they love football so what was your earliest memory in football yeah um mine would have been a little bit different where i was i was born in and um, chicago illinois over in the usa so we didn't emigrate back over to Ireland until I was about 10. So straight away, you know, I, when I got in the streets of, of Dublin, you know, everybody had a football. So I would have been 10 years old, would have been the first time when I kicked the ball. And and from from that moment on, I just loved it. I was always a sporty type of child. And I got involved with a, with a team from Terenure, Bushy Park Rangers. and. I had, you know, an unbelievable um, experience there for the eight years I was involved with them, you know, under a lot of really good coaches that kept all the players enthusiastic about football. We all wanted to get back down to, to, to train, to play the games the weekend. And unfortunately, the team I was with wouldn't have been um, the best team in, that the Rangers Football Club have ever produced. But... We enjoyed it. That was the most important thing. But I was lucky enough then to get an opportunity to go into the League of Ireland with Bohemians, which was managed by Eamon Gregg and Morris Price was his assistant at the time. And that gave me a real insight into, you know, your, your four steps of, of being a professional footballer. I am, um, you know, playing with a lot of really, really good players, Pat Benlin, Paul Whelan. Dave Tilson was there, Robbie Best, and um, you know, talented, talented footballers. And um, I was only in and out initially. Um, the, the jump was massive going from schoolboy football to, to that environment. It was huge. But, you know, eventually when things settled down, a new manager came in, Turlock O'Connor, and, and sort of had belief and faith in me and, and played me every week with Bohemians. And, you know, it's. Just the love for football just grew and grew and eventually there was cross-channel interest and I, I eventually made the, the step over to England with Newcastle United which was managed by Kevin Keegan at that particular time and now all of a sudden it's a it's it's a whole new level where you're rubbing shoulders with, with David Ginola, Alan Shearer and Dave Batty, Rob Lee you know internationals top class players and it was an unbelievable experience you know kenny daglish came in and took over and you know, shay given came in as a um, goalkeeper uh, obviously and uh, a fantastic goalkeeper too but uh you know a lot of great memories there but un unfortunately things didn't work out and you know kenny was honest and open enough to to call me in and just say look it's it's not going to happen for you here at newcastle united and you know in fairness to me put a um, pathway in place for me to go on loan to try to strike a deal with another club and tommy Bournes, who would have been the reserve team manager at that time um, made a move to redden football club and, and tommy took me there so um that was a part of my career where I was certainly littered with it was littered with injuries and, and what have you and um, eventually I made the step back to uh, I, you could say the step forward to uh, Shelburne Football Club because that's where I really enjoyed my football again Darren McKeady signed me and still you're, you're training every day with, with really good players own here Tony McCarthy Pat Scully, Paul Dillon, Pat Fenlon, Stephen Gagan, you know, really good players at that stage. And then eventually Pat took over 
and well, there was only a handful of us were full time at that stage. Pat took over, and the whole club became full time, and that's where we we really excelled. And and you know, we, we had some you know, memorable European occasions, and and you know, the introduction of Wes Houlihan to all that was uh, fantastic and great memories at Shelburne Football Club. What what was the period like at Shells, uh, Jim? Because like I grew up as a massive Shells fan, going to the games and stuff like that, and kind of it probably would have been just after Dermot Keeley had ma- had been manager and Pat came in. I think he was player manager for a little bit, and then um, things just Ollie Byrne and Pat and the thing just took off, and it was European football. Then there was the the Hadrick split game, you know lots of trophies won in that period but you know you, you spoke there having setbacks and stuff like that how, how was that firstly the setbacks back then because you know nowadays people have you know phones instant access all this type of stuff back then you wouldn't have had any of that you'd probably have you know i don't know a phone that you could phone back to your house like a, a landline house phone or something like that maybe um but but like nowadays people don't have that but just firstly how was that for yourself kind of the setbacks there. How did you handle them at, at that point? Yeah, look, they're, they're difficult. You know, setbacks would have been, you know, being released from a club. Obviously, would have been your injuries, and I had a fair few injuries. But the support system that are around players now were a lot bigger and stronger than what they were when I was a player. So, look, I can deal with things myself. I, I wouldn't have really rang home to say this is happening or that's happening, you know, I, I would just take the whole burden on uh, by myself and say, okay, I'll make a decision now myself. So I, I didn't have an agent or anybody that worked or represented me. So that, that's the way I dealt with it. I just made a decision. I says, right, give everything you have now to this decision, whether it's going back to Shelbourne and playing. I say, I'm going to make the most I can out of this opportunity to play with Shelbourne Football Club. But, um, and, and it was something that I've no regrets because, you know, I, I, I just loved every moment of putting on a, on, a, on a red jersey. You know, it was it was the group that was there. It was, you know, I'm not going to sound like sounding cliche, but, you know, the fans were great. Uh, I loved playing at Talker Park. I loved that we were winning. Um, uh, a lot of things at, the, at, at that stage, it, it was it was great. But... You know, every training session we went into, you you knew you had to perform, you know, because of the, the quality of players that were there. Joseph and Doe, we played in a World Cup. We all knew about Wes Houlihan's um, talent. Shuey Boone came in, Jason Boone. You know, we'd, Dave Rogers uh, came in. We'd, Dave Crawley. You know, the, the list is endless, you know. And, and every training session we had was, you know, it, it was... An unbelievable intensity and and you know for example we had my assistant uh, now with the under 21s uh, alan reynolds we, we signed alan reynolds and and he came in and he couldn't get over the intensity and the competitiveness of the training sessions but that was the culture that was developed there and i've no doubt that that was the culture that helped us be successful um in whether it was domestically or you know we, we went on a, a decent European run against, as you say, had split and, you know, eventually Deportivo put a, put a stop to it, but, you know, fantastic experience. Yeah, because just, I actually had Owen Heary on the show before uh, and he was speaking about that, you know, he spoke about the kind of, even the characters, although sometimes it might end up being, it could be fighting in the dressing room, like Owen said that happened against Lille, fighting in the dressing room, but then still to go out and get the, the draw in the end, you know, it was only kind of fighting because he wanted to win so badly. That's what it seemed like. Yeah, I, I won't forget that myself. Um, at half time, it was certainly a half time team talk that I wasn't expecting, but it was. Um, you know, it, it was a pretty uh, chaotic scene at half time. But, you know, we went out, we, we got a two all draw in the second half. But the thing about that group of players, what was said there was 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 left there at half time. But, we, you know, you do have time to, to reflect as a team saying, right, that can't happen again. So what, what are we going to do to make sure it doesn't happen again? So it wasn't just one of these 
fights or arguments and, and it was left, you know. We made sure as a group and the, the culture that supported that was really um, how do we make sure that A, B and C doesn't happen again to this group, that we, we get to that situation again at halftime. So that, that was, you know, senior players and um, working things out the way they seem fit at that particular stage. But, uh, well, come here, you know, with, with training ground bus stops, like, like in every environment, it, when you've got that level of competitiveness and intensity, things do happen. And, and you know, it's important that they're, they're just left there because uh, that, that could be detrimental to any type of culture if it's, if it's, it's, if it's lingering on and, and causing harm to something you've worked hard to get to. Yeah, well, I think that's the case in all walks of life, isn't it? You know, you might not get on with someone that you work with or whatever, but it's it's left within the building or whatever. So I think it's it's a similar kind of approach there, as you say. But just kind of your your time at Shells, then kind of leading on from that and, and the rest of your career and stuff like that. Talk me through, you know, the rest of your days at Shelburne and then moving on from there. Yeah, look, what happened with the Shells was I probably should have read the script where. Pat started asking me to go down and look at the, uh, you know, the B team, and you know, there was a couple of weekends where he asked me, "Can I go and manage the B team?" So, you know, I said, "Absolutely, no problem." You know, anything to help out. But probably looking back now, he was sort of pushing me to uh, a different role. But you know, it's something that I'll always be thankful for him before because that's where I got the bug of coaching. I enjoyed it. I had been doing bits with with schoolboy teams in any way while I was still playing and, and you know, I had a real passion about teaching and younger players and how to play the game is what I thought the best to my ability to, at, at that time. And, and it's only until you do coach education, you, you realize there is sort of performance gaps for you as a coach, but you know, if, and if I'm going to be honest, you know, towards the, 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 the latter part of my, career with Shelbourne. It, I, I would have liked him to play more, but I think everybody when they're 34, 35 years old would like to play more. But again, I'd be honest and, and humble enough to understand, you know what, that there's younger players in there that will get a silver silverware. And, and, you know, the day Pat uh, had a meet with Pat, he brought me up to Talker Park and he just said, look, Jim, um, that's it, you know, there's, you know, the budget's being cut. There was money issues there, as we all know. And, you know, I, I was disappointed, but I'll never forget the last thing I said is, look, Pat, I haven't got me medal yet. When can you organise me medal? In fairness to Pat, you got me, me medal within a couple of days. But that's that's sort of the full-time element with Shells was finished. And a lot of water went under the bridge um, with the club. And we got back to being part-time. Dermot came in. Dermot Keeley came in. And, and rescued the club, so to speak. You know, we came in with um, Collie O'Neill and, and I was part of that um, sort of rebuilding process. Um, not that I had too much input with it. You know, I was May team captain, but again, I was I, I found myself picking up injuries and I knew, you know, I was uh, certainly coming to the closing stages of my career, but I couldn't let go. I enjoyed playing and enjoyed it. Like everybody, you enjoy training grounds and banter you enjoy winning games you enjoy the whole prep before both training and, and games but um, look sadly it, it comes to an end that's for sure and one thing I'll, I'll always be thankful for the, the clubs um, that I played for yeah it's funny when you actually talk about Dermot Keeley rescuing the club he was actually my maths teacher for the leaving at that time he, uh, he was actually okay. never in due to that <laughs> I think he, um, remember, has it? He teaches Richie Foran as well, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, um, no, I probably would have been like yourself, you know what I mean? I probably, uh, I would have struggled at maths if he was my teacher, you know, because, uh, uh he had a way of, of teaching. But look, Dermot was great, you know, very knowledgeable, <laughs> very knowledgeable, um, and manager, um. I'd know quite well. I probably would have frustrated frustrated him because of and um, the, the amount of time I was I was on the treatment table and look, I, I, you know, there's nothing I can say. What what happens happens. Well, I've always respected Dermot 
and you know I learned a lot from them with regards to being a head coach too you know so I'll always be thankful to Derma for that and you know Collie O'Neill was in with them too and, and the two of them forged a really uh, healthy partnership yeah, well, let's hope that Shells can get back to, to those heights again over the next couple of years and stuff like that. Uh, I am, I assume you still keep up to date with uh, Shells results and stuff like that, would you? I, I certainly do. I certainly do. And, and there's a lot of really good people working at Shelburne Football Club at the minute. You know, you've got the two Hendersons, you know, really passionate people about football. You've got, I think, Captain's gone in there at the minute. And then, you know, on the coaching staff, you, you've got, you know, Ian Morris, you've got uh, Alan Reynolds, um, who's with us with, with you in the 21s. And, you know, he'd be a real uh, plus with Shelburne Football Club. And then down the age groups, you, um, Willie O'Connor, who I, I know we, we well, he used to be involved with the under 18 schools team. He's a fantastic coach. Damien Duff with you under 17s, he's a massive asset. Passion, drive, and knowledge that he'll help those players, and you know it's it's in a good place. Is it perfect? No, like, like everything, it's not. But they're going in the right direction, and give give them time, and uh, um, they'll be a formidable uh, team for sure. Yeah, of course. Well, let's let's hope that happens. But just get more more on yourself, Jim. Just um, obviously, when Stephen went and took the full-time uh, international role as the Ireland manager, you obviously then got promoted. You were his assistant, you got promoted. I think it was a little bit overshadowed in that sense, and that's not down to anything else. It's just the way COVID went. But just kind of on yourself, as I mentioned, this, this is more kind of about yourself. So just from a coaching point of view, do you want to talk us through your coaching journey up to, to where you are now and maybe some of the players who you've kind of helped bring through the, the ranks from your early days of coaching as well? Yeah, well, as I said before, I would have... You know, when I went into coach education, I understood that I was far from the complete coach and, you know, that particular space I was in, whether I was working at schoolboy football or or whatever else, I, you know, I've always said to myself, well, you, you've got to get better here. You've got to get better. I was always very conscious of that. And even when I was working with, you know, schoolboy teams in, in Dublin or Kildare and, it was time and time again, I, I reflect and say, right, where do I need to go now? And, and probably what, one of the biggest learning course for me was going in as a caretaker with, with Shamrock Rovers for um, a number of months. And I'll always be, be grateful to the board at that time to give me an opportunity. But I did see at first hand, you know, w what it takes to be a top manager and, and the performance gaps where I was at that time to where you needed to be to, to work with a team like Shamrock Rovers. And it, it was fantastic. And I think it's probably a credit to every other manager that I worked under, how seamless they made the whole thing look as being a head coach. Because when I was there, you were dealing with the media, you're dealing with players, you were dealing with the medical staff. And, you know, while you're working on uh, getting your game plan right um, for the, the following Friday. So is it, an unbelievable uh, journey that I had, albeit uh, two months with Shamrock Rovers, where I learned a hell of a lot. And I think it's important that, yeah, you get the experience, but you've got to have a plan, you know, put in place afterwards. How can you get better at being what you want to be with regards to a head coach? So it wasn't too long after that, I was involved with the Emerging Talent Programme with the FEI, which was a program ran every Monday uh, for um, emerging players who are 14, 15 years old. And that gave me an opportunity where you're working with the likes of Nathan Collins, Connor Masses, and players of that ilk. And, and you know, I, I, I loved it. Albeit it was only every every Monday for about an hour and a half, but it gave me a chance to, to work with these players. And it gave me a chance also to work alongside a lot of really co good coaches, qualified coaches um, in that program. So, you know, I was in that space at that time and I was saying, okay, how do I become a better coach? And and I was lucky enough, Paul Doolan asked me to go in 
with him with doing the nineteens and the eighteens and, and you know Paul's a fantastic coach and I took loads from Paul and you know the way he was organized and the information he gave to the players was was excellent and I, I learned loads from there but while also doing that I was doing my own stuff in terms of uh, working with uh, schoolboy teams such as St. Joseph boys and with a lot of good players who were international players as well and on a voluntary basis all sort of gearing towards making me a better coach because that's you know ultimately that's what we all want to do as coaches we want to become the best possible teachers or coaches that we can so the, the time came where the under 18s position became um, available and, and I was successful in the interview process for that and, and that was even more learning now all of a sudden being a head coach again and, and stuff that stood by me when I was with Shamrock Rovers and um, you know I, I, I took it on board and, and you're constantly as a coach you're constantly you, you have that sort of that curiosity that you just want to get better you, you're, you want to learn more about you know, coaching methodologies uh, formations and you know, it's something that I've, I've got this real tourist for and, and it'll continue because it's my character. Even, you know, when I was a player, I always wanted to become the best possible player and true um, thick and thin. I, I've always tried and, and it's the same now with me as a coach and going in when Stephen gave me the opportunity to go in with him with the under 21s, I, it was certainly something I couldn't turn down. Why? Because... I feel he, he has been the most successful coach in this in this country. What he's done at Dundalk was was unbelievable, you know, and and I wanted to learn from that. I was desperate to and if that journey only lasted a year with Stephen, so be it. I know I would have been a far better coach after walking uh, shoulder to shoulder with Stephen and, and with Keith Andrews too. So um but I have always had that sort of mantra that whatever space you're in, you, you give it everything you have become the best possible whether it's an assistant or head coach that you possibly can and lucky enough I got the under 21s role and and that's something that I take a lot of pride and I'm, I'm proud of being the head coach and and I've already brought with the help of the staff as well you know different areas to the 21s and um, that that you know probably wasn't there before and it's just to make this whole program um, a, a healthier program and, and, and making sure that we're going to be successful. How do you, how do you measure success with the 21s? It, it's, there's no doubt about it. It's developing players to go on and play senior football, but it's also to qualify for tournaments, to, to play against the best teams in Europe. That's a real, real barometer of where, where our players are at when, when, they're, when they're on the same pitch as players from Spain. Um, England, Germany in competitive tournaments. Just on that, uh, Jim. Just in terms of your, your, what would be your kind of coaching philosophy in that sense, like, and your, and your sort of principles, just as an insight to kind of yourself as a coach. Yeah, well, my principles would be very similar to, you know, what's being run here in the association from under fifteen to the senior team. Is you want to play an attractive brand of football. You want to play through the tours when you can. You want to get players um, full of confidence and, and, and an understanding where they should be on the pitch um, at specific times during the build-up. Defensively, you know you want your team because it's in our, our Irish DNA in terms of working hard as you can to, to, to get the ball mm. back. And you know there are principles that we'd all agree on and there are principles that to be trashed out in regular monthly meetings that we have with the international managers and it's um you know I, I think it's important that we're certainly on the same hymn sheet but with regards to philosophy you know my coaching philosophy would be you know creating that a real learning environment for for everybody for your staff for the players you know sense of autonomy for the players giving them an opportunity to give feedback and you know by looking at the opposition play and my coaching philosophy would be you know off off the the pitch philosophy would be you know 
professional, being honest with players, um, um, you know, be, being honest with your staff, hard work. And I think it's important with your coaching philosophy that if somebody was to walk by an under 21 training session, they, they could see all these values um, screaming out at them. And, and that's something that I certainly take pride in, you know, uh, the, the off field coaching philosophy. But certainly on it, it's, you know, playing football the right way because there's, like Stephen, you know, what, what I would want is that anybody that comes to an under 21s game, that they're walking away after the 90 minutes going, you know, that was proper entertainment. Really enjoyed that. Uh, the way that they're trying to play football the right way because it's it's an entertainment business that's for sure and and you've got to make sure that um the fans leave saying i enjoy that win lose or draw okay that's something that we can't control but what we can control is um our principles and, and what we're trying to do as a team yeah well it's really nice to actually hear that from yourself but uh just on the the, the 21s itself obviously we've seen a lot of players get promoted through the system or whatever we've had you know probably some players taken away from you as well getting promoted to the national team due to covid and so on but is there any players that are coming through now that you're excited to see coming through playing for yourself yeah look there's a a, a lot of players and it's look it's great and as i said earlier on you know you measure its success you know with the 21s with regards how many players Yes, moved on to the senior team. You know, we've nine players last year that got that got call ups, and you know, it's, it's proud and it's you know, it's it's a great it's great for those players. This year, you know, I don't know will we will we get the same number, but there's certainly lots of really talented players that that could be knocking on the door. You know, unfortunately, we we've have three of them that have got. You know, um, long-term injuries. You know, Nathan Collins just had an operation yesterday. I think he's a he's a fantastic talent. He's you know he, he's been um, on everybody's sort of minds at the minute because he, he was in such a good place with Stoke. There was talks about um, transfer uh, fees you know, ranging from five to fifteen million and. And he's certainly a talent with, 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 you know, unbelievable potential, you know. And what, what I, what I think that's brilliant about Nathan, he, he's a, he's a grounded individual. He, he understands the work ethic that's required to get him there, and he's somebody that I, I hold in very high esteem, and I think he's got an unbelievable uh, future ahead of him. Will Smallbone, and um, with Southampton. Um, you know, I was actually watching the game um, where, where he got injured against uh, uh, Leicester and he was doing exceptionally well. And, you know, I, I got on the phone to him the very next day saying, how are you? And he says, I'm getting a scan. And it turns out um, the day after when he got the results that he, he'd, he'd done his ACL. So he'd be out for an extended period of time. But he, he's, again, somebody that is a, an exciting talent and fantastic, fantastic potential. Um, certainly Stephen knows all about him I know all about him and, um, um, and I'm sure people will when the new campaign starts in September that hopefully he'll be fit and ready to, to take part in those games video is sponsored by Team Fipe Team Fipe is an online payment platform that helps sports clubs with the management and coordination of their sports club Team Fipe supports thousands of clubs coaches, players and their parents they are there every step of the way for both club officials, players and parents. Their account management and customer service is what makes them the number one sports management platform in the world. Manage your finances, assign people to roles at the club. This is an ideal tool to keep on top of your club management and admin. It couldn't be easier. It's a simple, efficient system to keep on top of your annual fees, whether it's collecting subs or monthly payments managing finances for club trips etc team fee pay is the way to go book in for a zoom demo at teamfeepay.com to get a look at how the features work with a reliable member of their team check out teamfeepay.com the link is in the description here we go just like future ambitions it's obviously to qualify for tournaments that's obviously what you want to do now obviously you want a, a national team that we can be proud of certainly you know um 
to, to come close in the last campaign was a real wrench, you know, to, to take it to the last window where, you know, essentially we had it in our hands uh, at one stage, you know, and, and to not get there was, was a real punch in the stomach. But, you know, we've, we've learned from that. Um, and as a staff, we, we know what's required going forward. So what's important now with the group of players is that the whole process starts again against Wales in March and, and hopefully, and we could get that tournament um, on over in the too long because I've seen the benefits of it where you, you had a group of players who'd only an experience of playing against Luxembourg in the last campaign. Then they played in Toulon and to see the players develop confidence, develop connection between each other and the staff, what was, was unbelievable. And I've seen a work, so it needs to happen with this group of players, whether it's Toulon or another tournament where we can have an, an extended period of time with each other, where we, we can get all that across to the players again, what we're looking uh, to do, the style of play, and, and you know that connection with the players, because there'll be quite a few new players that'll be, um, that'll be on board. So it's important that we get that right, that will set us up nicely for the campaign starting in September. And, you know, it's it's really about stretching these players, supporting these players in a hope that we can get to uh, a European finals, which would be um, fantastic for this group of players. And in terms of their development, it would be unbelievable because we've seen what 21 football did for the likes of Aaron Conley, um, Jason Malumbi, um, Darrell Shea. You know, so who's to say that there could be more players that experience that 21 um, experience during the campaign and, and hopefully go on and, and play in the Premiership or in the Championship and, and go on and make more uh, senior appearances? Yeah, I think, it, it, you know, you mentioned that about the players coming through. I think it was actually from the Toulon tournament. A lot of players went on then to make first team appearances at their clubs. And as you mentioned there, they can look at them now. Some of them are playing in the Premier League, like Darrow Shea got promoted and stuff like that to the Premier League with West Brom. Has there, just, just lastly on a player, actually, has there been any more information on John no. Joe Patrick Finn? I hope I said that right. <laughs> you, you sure did. And uh, no. I have spoken to the mom there a couple of weeks ago and there'll be more contact made about the, the up and coming camp. So I'll have more on that, Paul. Um, but it's 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 still been positive enough, you know. Um, um, but I think the important thing is not to to rush the player, you know, and, um, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, it is is that has come from Bally Harness and, um, he, um, you know, that, that there's a real emotional attachment for John, John Joe Finn, and um, with Ireland, you know, and, and it's really, you know, I don't want to be aggressive in the pursuit of John Joe Finn. I, you know, it's it's his deci decision. What, what I've sort of laid out to him is the strong and unique pathway that's that exists here with the Republic of Ireland. And, you know, I, I'm sure... There was other countries involved in, in trying to to get him on board, but you know I'd have to question. Okay, how strong is their pathways? You know, is, is there an opportunity of, of playing senior international football within the next two three years? I don't know because I do know there is an aggressive approach by certain countries where they, they'll just try to hoover up as many uh, players as they possibly can, and, and they could have 10, 15. 20 players for one position, but, uh, but they don't mind. And that's the, the relentless pursuit they have in, in terms of building their player pool. Yeah, I suppose all you can do in that regard is just show your interest, as you've said there. But just on yourself personally, um, just something that maybe not people don't know, you're actually studying a Masters in Limerick at the moment. How is that going and, and what are you? What, what is that you're studying? I'm studying applied coaching science and why I went down that route would have been, look, our head of education, um, Noel O'Regan, you know, sent me an email about it, and, and I thought about it, and I said, you know what, it's it's certainly some 
sort of space I'd like to go to in terms of, of learning. I've done the, the pro license and I got a real bug for taking on information. And I said, probably the next step now would be a master's. And, um, and in it, you're learning the whole science behind coaching, the, the facts behind coaching. And, you know, you're talking about coaching philosophies, values, you're talking about uh, performance analysis, all at a really serious uh, level of detail. Um, you know, what, what, what's really inspiring in the courses is that we're working with um, different coaches from, from different codes who are all like-minded in terms of the pursuit of being becoming the best possible coach in the, that they can be. And I've learned so much already by, um, you know, it's all been done by a, a Zoom at the minute, but I, I've learned so much already from the tutors, from the peers, and I think it's a fantastic course and it's, you know, it's it's time consuming. There's no doubt about it, but I do see um, the value in it. And it, it'd be something that I would definitely recommend to, to any aspiring coach that has done the pro license to, you know, think about going this route as well, because it's, it really delves deep into um, the whole aspect of coaching. Yeah, and just one last thing I, I I was told by Adam there that uh you know you'd like to take a train session with the League of Ireland team before an international window why is that I am um, I think there's a little bit of um you know giving back to a league where I developed and I had you know the the, the luxury of getting a, a club in the UK through playing in the League of Ireland um I love coaching. I love getting on the grass with players, and that's certainly something you don't get enough of when you're an international manager. So it's about keeping your eye in. But what I really, really sort of like to do, and it's something that it's evolving as as we go on with it, is to to sit down with the coaches afterwards and, and you know give our sort of rationale behind this uh, coaching session that we put on, whether it's with Shelburne Football Club. Club Kildare, Waterford, Cork. You know, I think it's important that I get I get to as many clubs as I possibly can, and I'm I'm certainly open to go to any club in the country because I think as younger 21s international head coach, you've got that responsibility of helping coaches grow, develop if they want. You know, I'm, I'll definitely put it out there, and anybody that comes back to me and says that they'd like a session. I, you know, I'd love to go down, whether it's with the 19s, 17s, 15s. I've no problems at all because I've got that passion um, for coaching, but I've also got that passion to to help uh, coaches develop, you know, because there's, the greater good of all this is that if you've, if you've got coaches who are developing, you've got players who are developing, and I think that's important. Yeah, well, that's great. It's great to hear. And obviously, you're, you're so passionate about the coaching that, you know, you can, t- can continue to adapt and develop your game, which is brilliant. So I can only say a huge thanks for taking the time out to have a chat with me. And hopefully now people have a better understanding and insight to you as a man and obviously as a coach. So thanks very much for taking the time out to have a chat with me. I really appreciate it. Thanks to me and Paul. Lovely talking to you. Thank you. Top man. The IFF TV Podcast, presented by Paul Nealon.